Usually we try to take the most SEO friendly question and move it to the top of these questions episodes, but we came to the realization that the fashion world is in a little bit of a, uh, a trend lull right now. The whole industry is fed off of these little micro trends that are meant to last for two weeks. Barbie core is a great example of this. But yeah, men's week was done in June, couture week was done in July, and there isn't a big PR rollout around couture week, but now we're just waiting on women's wear in September, so there's no like trendy thing for me to jump in here and talk about. That's honestly great because we don't f with trends on this channel. Questions time. You ask them, I answer them. What makes something a brand staple and what makes something repetitive? E.g. Rick Owens' silhouette is considered iconic, brand staple, but Maria Grazia Chiuri's Dior is repetitive. Um, I, I think that the big difference between those two things is that Dior changes extremely slowly. Rick Owens, like by the time you can clock and like confirm that it's like, oh, like the tech shoulder, the tech shoulder is definitely something that's happening right now. He'll move on to something else. Like the tech shoulder seriously might be gone. Like next, next season, it really might not be here anymore. And the tech shoulder was introduced maybe, I literally, this is off the top of my head, it was maybe introduced two and a half, three years ago. Whereas like, if you ask me like, Bliss, what was like the newest best-selling item at Dior? Like, I have no idea. Because it, it just feels like everything at that brand has just always been there and always will be there. The only things that are like innovative that come out of Dior are very niche special projects that get introduced into the couture and that get like sold to just clients that give them half a million dollars a year. The public never really sees it or gets to really appreciate it unless Dior chooses to make a little video about it. And I don't wanna like depict that only as like, this is only absolutely terrible and there is nothing of any value here. On the occasion that Dior does make a crazy documentary about like some of these really specific niche projects, it does always end up being really cool, fascinating stuff. It's just that as far as the things that go into the runway and things that make it into major editorial, and certainly all of the stuff that you can go and see at the Dior stores, there's just not a lot of what the general public thinks of as um, innovative or uh, fresh ideas or things that are interesting. It's kind of a bummer. I wish they just had like, it would be so cool if Christian Dior like at their headquarters or something had like an archive or like a little museum of like all the cool special projects that they've done. I would pay 25 bucks to go into that museum. That would be sick. You just like get to see all these like crazy techniques and stuff. That would be awesome. But yeah, I, I think Rick, Rick has spoiled us in a lot of ways because he, he, he changes so much and he's giving us so, so much over the course of his career that I think we, we like get a new shoe and then within like two years, we're expecting to have like, where's the new kiss boot? Most people expect it like once a year from him and that's just not possible for any designer on earth to do. How do you have so much passion for fashion? How do you have so much passion for fashion design without feeling the need to design clothes from your own perspective? This is a really great question because I think we can use it to talk about a big misconception in the fashion industry generally. Most people only think that if you want to be in the fashion industry, you need to become a designer. A fashion designer is the first job, and then the second job is I'm a stylist, and then the third job is I'm a photographer. And then outside of those three, th oh, and then model. Sorry, there's also the models. And besides those things, what else could there be? Like, I don't want to be an accountant. There are literally hundreds of jobs in fashion. And instead of trying to like summarize them here, which will kind of further bottleneck people's understanding of like what jobs they could possibly go into in fashion, I'm going to encourage you to find them in a very specific way. You can look up what kinds of fashion jobs there are by getting onto LinkedIn and then going to a place that you wish that you worked at. And then just look at who the employees are. Look at what their qualifications are. Look at where they've worked in the past. Look at what their job title is. If you don't understand what a job title is, Google it, look it up. Look up other people on LinkedIn with that same job title. See if they have a description of what they've done, any projects that they've worked on. This is the way that you can learn about all of the different jobs that make up the fashion ecosystem. There are a ton, a ton of people in fashion who are not designers, stylists, photographers, or models who have incredibly fulfilling creative careers. Go look up what those things are. To answer your question more directly, I guess, uh, I'm a fashion critic. 
absolutely love what I do. I am never looking at fashion designers and thinking like, why not me? Oh, it should be me up there. Why not me? I love what I do. And also, frankly, I do not have a creative vision inside of me that is on par with the vision of a Craig Green, of an Iris Van Herpen. Those people have very strong singular visions inside of them, and that is not a skill that I have. And that's okay. It's okay that I don't have it. In the same way that I would not make a very good surgeon, I also would not make a good fashion designer. I am deeply invested in fashion and I don't have the chops or the desire or the vision to be a fashion designer. And that's okay. I want to show you all something. So this is a book that I got. It is the Chanel Catwalk book. Catwalk book. It is uh, all of the looks that Karl Lagerfeld put on the runway during his tenure at Chanel. I bought this book for research for a video that I'm not going to tell you about yet. It has nothing to do with Chanel, but I thought that this book would have an answer to a question that I had for a long time and I bought the book. I did all of my research in this and I found that that question that I had did not have the answer that I wanted. And that was okay. And I think that that illustrates really excellently why this being a viewer funded project is so excellent. Uh, we are not under the constraints here that other publications are where every single minute of the workday has to result in some kind of money being made. We are able to take our time, research things properly, and then bring you all the best coverage in the industry. If you get value out of what we do here um, and you want us to be able to continue to devote our time to research and high quality content, reflect that value in the amount that you support us with on Patreon. If you're a student and you just don't have any dependable income right now, that's totally cool. The $3 tier is totally fine. You get all the exclusive videos, you get to join the Discord. We're not gonna punish you for being a student. But if you have the finances to be able to fund us in a more serious way with nine bucks a month, if you wanna up it to 15, we have a $30 tier for people who really want to invest in this project. Please just reflect the amount that we give to you. That's all I ask. Appreciate you. Next question. Here's a great one. Is hating a curse in fashion culture? Um, yes, but so is the opposite of that. There, there is this incredible thing that we're all culturally not doing very well right now that seemed to be super popular for so long and then it just sort of like all disappeared and I don't know where it went. This idea of sort of just thinking about something. Um, everybody switches so quickly into this like, holy shit, I love it, they can do no wrong, this is so good, oh my gosh, yes, 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 to usually to the same people just a little bit later, I hate this, this is fucking awful, get out of here, never get, I am trying, especially as I get older, I am 33, I'm trying very hard to become more and more comfortable with this idea of, I'm not sure how I feel about that yet, I need to think about that more and to just sort of allow myself to chew on it and to be okay if I am not getting closer to an answer. To be actively involved in that thing, but to be comfortable if it's like, I've taken in a lot of information about that, I have thought about this a lot, I'm not sure that I am any closer to a concrete answer for myself. Being comfortable with that, that feeling specifically. Okay, this is a really intense question. Uh, is full nudity fashion? Looks like we just found our thumbnail. I think this was like a really big thing in the 90s, right? Where like they would send models down totally topless or uh, I think there were a few cases where they just sent a model just like totally naked, just like down the runway, like no thong, no nothing. I would say that that is not fashion in the way that we're saying fashion, like this is fashion because obviously clothes and then no clothes for nudity. It's a, uh, yeah, the, the things are mutually exclusive, but having full nudity as part of a show is part of the trappings that make fashion a storytelling art form. So like in the same way that you could leave um, like uh, Vaquera, you could leave fake hundred dollar bills around on the floor just for like when people are walking in and taking their seats and stuff like everyone is having this moment of being like, holy shit, like did someone drop money? And that's happening like all over the room in the same way that that is not technically fashion, but that is adding to the storytelling of what they're doing with that show. Nudity kind of can serve that purpose if the designer deems it part of that. I will say though that like, I mean, full nudity is a little, it's a little ham-fisted. That, that would be a hard thing for, if, if I was at a show and there was like, 
full frontal nudity on a model that walked the full catwalk just totally stark naked. It would be very hard for me not to walk away from that being like, okay, edgelord. Okay, so the whole goal with these questions is that they are anonymous, and I'm going to keep this anonymous, but I will let you know that this question is from a fashion designer who shows at one of the fashion weeks. They ask, what is the end destination slash goal for the fashion industry? That is a good question. I would think that the goal for most designers is to radically change the face of what the general public wears. It's that classic goal of art or design where everything before you seems strangely obsolete and everything after you bears the mark of your work. But I'm wondering if maybe you were emphasizing the word fashion industry specifically and if it's the industry then it's the same. I'm not I'm not trying to get like too preachy here or whatever, but I mean Capitalism just keeps going until it just like has to eat itself eventually. This is like asking what is the goal of a duck? Um, the goal of the duck is to quack and eat food and have adorable duck sex and swim for as long as nature will let it. Is there an argument to be made for boycotts of companies like Hugo Boss and Chanel considering prior history or should we consider these actions as separate and remove them from the equation nowadays? The reason that Chanel the company is in the fashion history books is because of Gabrielle Chanel. The reason that Chanel is a relevant part of the fashion conversation in 2023 is because of Karl Lagerfeld, who was not a Nazi. He was a dick, he was not a Nazi. Gabrielle Chanel that was in fact a Nazi. There is no argument at all. And people have tried to dispute me on this before, you need to cite all of your sources because my sources are plain to be found anywhere on the internet. There was a bunch of declassified documents in 2014 from the French government that said that she not only had a Nazi code name, but that she was involved in Operation Modelhut, in, which was just gaining information about the, so that they could invade Madrid later on. She was actively involved with the Nazi party and the Third Reich as an officer, not an officer, as a... Um, agent. If you have something to say that opposes that, I need you to cite your sources and not just say, hey, this guy is wrong, because I uh, frankly think you are wrong. <laughs> that sucks. It sucks that Gabrielle Chanel was involved in that. She wasn't even German. Like, it, this, it, there is, there's absolutely no excuse for that. That absolutely sucks. Shame on her. I don't think it is intellectually honest to start um, yelling at Chanel in the comment section of their Instagram or to hold up signs outside of their headquarters or be mean to people who work there because I don't think we have any evidence that those people are Nazis. And especially considering that um, the world is still populated by a number of actual real life Nazis, um, I, I think that that anger is pretty misplaced. If you have another problem with the company, then, you know, express that other problem. But um, pretending like uh, the founder of the company a super long time ago did thing, absolutely did do things for the Nazi party, bears some kind of relevance on the guy who's just going to work in Paris in 2023. I, I, don't, I don't think that, that, uh, that we are being honest with ourselves if we make that tie and uh, a, a strong enough tie that we start doing something about it. I don't, I don't think that's fair. And for the record, I, I actually have no idea about the Hugo Boss situation. I know that they made some of the Nazi uniforms or something. I, I really don't know much about that situation. So somebody will have to fill us in.